Hi, my name is Wade Burns and I'm an Applications Engineer at Maxim Integrated. In this video, I would like to demonstrate the various protections of the Max 33072E RS485 transceiver. I will also mention the common situations in which these protections are useful. The protections include plus or minus 40 volt common mode rejection, plus or minus 65 volt fault protection, three types of ESD protection, and polarity inversion. I will be using two MAX 33072E shields, which fit on many microcontroller boards, including the MAX 32625 embed. A shield and a micro make up one programmable transceiver. Two transceivers will communicate over one twisted pair of a 25 foot long Cat5 E cable. Each micro is programmed using the Embed online compiler. The code utilizes the Embed RS485 library at the address shown. Here is the code in action as viewed through TerraTerm terminals. The transceiver can be designated to transmit or receive. Once started, the same hex message is repeatedly sent and received about every two seconds. First up is the common mode rejection. The MAX 33072E can reject up to a plus or minus 40 volt signal that is common to both A and B data lines. This can happen, for example, when there's a long data cable through a factory floor and electromagnetic noise from other devices such as motors, solenoids, or actuators can influence it. This can also occur in the ground path between two grounds. This arises when a signal radiated by other devices or an AC power line induces currents in the ground path between the two devices, causing a voltage difference. The common mode voltage is the sum of these plus the driver offset. I demonstrate this common mode rejection by effectively raising the transmitter's ground to plus 40 volts with respect to the receiver's ground. Here we have the transmitter on the left and receiver on the right. The transmitter is programmed to send the same hex message about every two seconds. The receiver is programmed to send the received message through the microcontroller's USB port to the terminal on my laptop. The receiver, bottom adjustable power supply, and oscilloscope are all referenced to earth ground. The transmitter and its 5.3 volt power supply are both grounded to the bottom supply's output which now acts as an adjustable ground reference. I first restart each micro and tell the receiver to display the message, which looks like this up close. The transmitter's ground reference is then slowly raised. Each receive out pin is being probed, where yellow is the receiver's and blue is the transmitter's. I finally raise the transmitter's ground to 40 volts above the receiver's. The message is still faithfully delivered. Just to double check the difference in ground potentials, here's a direct measurement with the voltmeter. The A and B data pins can withstand up to a plus or minus 65 volt fault on the data lines. The transceiver will temporarily shut down operation and periodically check to see if the fault is removed. Once it is, operation resumes normally. The part is protected and functionality is preserved. A fault or overvoltage can occur, for example, when someone miswires a local power supply line to the data ports, or when a cable carrying both data and power lines are shorted together when their insulators are degraded due to heat and vibration from nearby equipment. To demonstrate a voltage fault, I have attached a plus 65 volt DC signal on the A line and then removed it. Both transmitter and receiver are powered through USB from the laptop and are referenced to earth ground. Both are also sending the receive out RO signal to the terminal and oscilloscope. The 65 volt fault is achieved by connecting these two power supplies in series and connecting the output to the transmitter's A pin. The voltmeter to the right is measuring the voltage on the A pin. I activate each transceiver and start communications. The message is successfully sent and received with no fault present.
Some time later, I introduced the 65 volt fault. As can be seen from the oscilloscope and laptop terminal, communications have stopped. The transmitter is no longer driving the transmission line. The transmitter's RO pin is not readable and the receiver is stuck waiting for the message. Some time later, I removed the 65 volt fault. Now looking at the oscilloscope and terminal, we see communications resume. The system is working the same as it did before the fault. Now for the ESD protections. The MAX 33072E A and B pins can withstand plus or minus 40 kV HPM discharge, plus or minus 10 kV contact discharge, and plus or minus 15 kV air gap discharge. The part continues to work without latch up or damage. Electrostatic discharge can commonly occur from either human touch or other equipment during production or out in the field for installation or maintenance. First is the human body model or HBM demonstration. Again, transmitter is on the left and receiver on the right. A series LR circuit is attached to the receiver's non-inverting A pin. The circuit has been tuned to replicate the HBM standard discharge curve when the contact discharge method is applied to it. The transceivers are powered through USB and grounded together with the gray jumper wire. They are grounded to the ESD gun ground and tabletop metal plane underneath the insulating mat. The oscilloscope is monitoring the receiver's receive out pin. The HBM standard testing calls for six zaps, three of each polarity. I have set them to be three seconds apart. The ESD gun is set to 26.7 kilovolts instead of 40 kilovolts. This two-thirds correction factor in pre-charge voltage is needed to adjust the contact peak current value to match the human body models. The same hex message is being repeatedly sent as in the other tests. The data transmission is compromised while the ESD strikes are occurring, but the receiver and transmitter quickly recover and continue to attempt to send and receive the message. As can be seen from the oscilloscope, communication still proceeds after all ESD strikes are applied. Next is the contact discharge demo. The setup is largely the same, except now the contact discharge is applied to the A-line through a jumper wire. Transceiver ground is now connected through bleeder resistors. Two series 470K ohm resistors to the table's metal plane, and another two from the metal table plane to the metal floor plane where the ESD gun is also grounded. This floor plane or ground reference plane is attached to earth ground. Here's a diagram to better show the connections. The contact discharge standard testing calls for 20 zaps, 10 of each polarity. I have set them to trigger every one second. Not all are shown as it becomes a little repetitive. Communications quickly recover and proceed as before. Lastly, the air gap discharge demo. This is the same test setup as before with the contact discharge. I just changed the tip to a rounded one and set the gun for air gap model. Since this is the only ESD test you can actually see and hear, I'll focus on the visual and audio aspect. It even survives that devastating zap and keeps on going. Now consider a situation where the A and B pins have been miswired. Perhaps during installation someone wired one or more transceivers A pin to the B data line and B pin to the A data line. In a large and complex system with many transceivers, perhaps in hard to reach places, this becomes more of a problem. Instead of spending time and money to rewire everything, you can simply change one value in your microcontroller code. The pole pin of the MAX 33072E can be set logic high to invert the polarity of the A and B pins. 
and that's it. I hope this video was useful to you. Thank you for watching. Bye-bye.